it was the late 90s in New York City, and as many of you, this may ring familiar to many of you, everybody thought that the market value of the young 20-something writer was that maybe she'd write another Sex in the City. <laughs> and so all of my professional prospects seemed to lie in the, would you like to write a review of sex toys uh, for this women's magazine? Very seriously, that once paid a very valuable sum of money. Um, would you like to write a first person column about your dating life? Would you like to write a first person column about your sex life? Would you like to write a first person column about your breakups? Um, not that there's anything wrong with any of that kind of writing, but that was the only thing I was told was within my grasp professionally. And when I got, despite the fact it had nothing to do with what I was actually doing professionally, which was writing about the film business and Harvey Weinstein. And um, when I got my job at Salon, uh, I had a wonderful, wonderful editor uh, who was also a feminist, and we began to run some stories that we just wanted to run about, and it was, you know, it, these were stories about politics and about pop culture and sometimes about, you know, Britney Spears, but they were from a feminist perspective. And people began to read them. And we began to get a lot of traffic and a lot of responses and a lot of letters. <coughs> and this was the most realizing, and I guess, I mean, it is a kind of power to realize that you don't have to do what, it, what the expectation is for you to do and, and the expectation for the way in which you can succeed. Um, and, and so it still amazes me that I, despite, <laughs> despite being told otherwise at every turn, that I wound up having the power, I guess it is the power, to have made a career out of writing from a feminist perspective, coming from a world in which that was inconceivable to me. Wow, wow. Yeah. That's interesting. We need that. <laughs> so, so Katha, um, since the media forms us as well as informing us, I, I didn't want to talk about politics and women in power without talking about the media. I'd love to know your thoughts, and, and maybe yours too, Rebe Rebecca, and, and, and yours too, Nita, about how the media today uh, either helps women or maybe makes women decide, mm -mm, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to, I don't want to put myself out there for that. What do you see in your work? Well, I think there's a lot of neg negative messages. Um, I'll just mention a few. One is, it's very important, the relentless focus on women's appearance that <laughs> comes up, you know, it doesn't matter who you are, you could probably be some dead Egyptian, <laughs> you know, some ancient Greek, and they'd be talking about whether you were pretty or not, um, and how much you weighed. And I think this is extremely discouraging that for people to accomplish anything, that, 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 that ends up putting them in the media light. They have to deal with this. They have to face it. You know, people are going to be talking about what they were wearing and how much they weighed and how old they were and whether they looked how old they were or not. And then the next paragraph is going to be about whether they were feminine enough in their demeanor and were they married and did they have children, all this stuff. Men don't have to put up with any of this. Um, and part of that, I guess, is, well, it's sexism, basically. Um, the, the spectrum for what men can look like and be considered to be, you know, normal and okay and boring is, is just much wider. Um, but you think of someone like Hillary Clinton and what she went through, my God. Um, and I don't know how that woman got out of bed some days. Um, and I think that that's something that does inhibit women in all kinds of ways. Um, and of course, it's not just if you're in the media, it's just you know, around you all the time. And I just wanted to say, you know, I, I follow like some of the younger women's blogs um, and, and websites, and one I like very much in some ways is Jezebel.com, which I think everyone out there should take a look at just to, you mm. know, keep up with what's happening. Um, but Jezebel is relentlessly about women's magazines, fashion, and sort of pop culture. And so these issues come up again and again and again. Um, and it's like some kind of weird love-hate relationship that I think women get to mm -hmm. in these subjects where they can't just say, you know, I just don't care. Mm -hmm. I just don't care what you think about what I look like. It's like, um, no, no, there they go again, talking about what I look like. But, it, you, you know, and I just wonder, as a person from a different generation where you, <coughs> you know, I was lucky enough to grow up in the 60s and 70s, where, early 70s, when they didn't even have brand name clothes. 
Um, you didn't, fashion models were not famous people that you were supposed to admire. Um, it's a completely different world, and what I, I really wish there was just that place of real resistance of just stepping away, because the media is not going to do it for you. They are not going to stop writing about this, because for many reasons, one of them being that there are always those people who want to read that, and the advertising, and selling things, and all the rest, mm -hmm. but I think it's very toxic. I, I just want to, Nita, since you've been in Congress since 1988, um, what's different? I mean, has have those things been ameliorated a little bit, or what do you think the younger women are, are dealing with as compared to what you were dealing with? Has it gotten better? What have you done to, yeah? Well, I just want to bring up another aspect. I think everything that you've said was absolutely valid, but I have never seen the meanness uh, such as we saw in these campaigns. Mm -hmm. Now, I have to tell you, I work closely with Nancy Pelosi. We've been in the Congress almost the same time. She's smart, she's collaborative, she's tough, she has vision, and she's also quite attractive. But there was a movement out there to vilify her and demean her that I thought, and I still think, is outrageous. Uh, and well, this, perhaps by it's the way, helpful to her that John Boehner cries well, because would, now she has permission I was to cry. Just, I was just <laughs> going to say that because of the new technology, you're using the iPad, you know, I haven't gotten to that yet, but I just had a briefing on the new technology in the last campaigns, and of course it was not just against women, uh, so I'm really... <laughs> Uh, modifying my answer, it was against men as well, but the meanness, the nastiness uh, is just out of sight. It is something that we all have to be concerned about, and because this technology can get on every blog, and within a day, I was looking at graphs, just watching how these commercials were out there, uh, they can penetrate a market in a weekend, and this is what happened in many of these races. So it was, it was both men and women, and in most of the races they used Nancy Pelosi as the symbol. So it was very relevant to her and being a woman and being a powerful woman. But we have to be concerned about this technology because it's destroying our democracy. The corporations don't have to disclose anything, and they are putting in one race out in Iowa, it happens to be the race of uh, a man, as I mentioned, within three days they put in several million dollars just to destroy him. And he won by just a little bit, mm -hmm. but many people didn't. So uh, if you happen to be a woman, uh, they, have, they go after you as a woman, but this is something that's happening with men and women Poor John Boehner. I think it's good that he cries and then he has some emotion and he feels deeply. We'll see as they mm -hmm. cut out education and health care. I hope he <laughs> cries about that as well. Right. 